You're on CY Interview. This is Chris Yandek, never shy to share his opinions on America's politics and the state of the country. We welcome back the former governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, for his fourth CY Interview. Jay Bildstein joins me. This is Chris Yandek, featured columnist Jay Bildstein is on this call with me. We welcome back to CY Interview the former governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, for his new book, Demo Crips and Rebloodigans, No More Gangs and Government. Government, government, ben, Governor Ventura, thank you so much for joining us both today. And starting with you, what have you been up to the last year, obviously, besides writing this book when we last spoke with you? Well, uh, really, that's about it. Uh, I leave the country every fall about Christmas time, and I now live, you know, I'm a born and raised Minnesotan, and I'm probably one of the few that doesn't know how to skate. Uh, I never liked winter. And I was a swimmer, so I spent all winters in Minnesota in a swimming pool when I was young. I was a competitive swimmer. And uh, then I joined the Navy, and unfortunately I went in the Navy in January, and they sent me to San Diego, and I realized there's places in January you can go that doesn't have snow. And so I now uh, I spend the winter of four to five months down living in the Baja, Mexico, and uh, and come back here every summer. And I'm fortunate I'm I'm of I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that, which is a wonderful lifestyle to have because I love Minnesota in the summer, but I just can't hack these winters. I don't like them. I never have, and I'd rather be down in Mexico in the winter. Well, I hear that. So that essentially, that's what I've been doing. And this year, I did something unique. I went to Mexico, and I didn't watch television for 45 days. Well, I, I, I hear you there in as fact, well. In fact, it's the first time I never, I can't remember uh, that I watched no of the NFL playoff games, none of them including the Super Bowl. Wow. Okay. It, it, you know, it actually, what you're saying reminds me of something I read about uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, that there was a time period, I believe, for two years in the 1940s where he said he found the news so depressing and counterproductive that for two years he just didn't read any news and it didn't seem to harm Gandhi. Was this born, was this born governor out of... A disgust with the mainstream media was just just you said, hey, I'm just not going to well, watch yeah, TV. Yeah, a lot of it, you know, a lot of it. Life in general up here, and the censorship that goes on, and the and you know the the untruth to the stories you hear, and the political persuasion of them all. Yeah, I would say that that probably a great deal of it was. I call it flushing out your brain. You know, and so I I go down to Mexico and I don't watch television, and it's kind of fun to be ignorant of all the BS that's going on in the political arena up here. Well, Jesse, arguably the most important thing in the book is you've come to the conclusion that third parties don't work and you believe there shouldn't be any parties at all. Given the fact that many like yourself find the two-party system disingenuous and are looking for alternatives to the Democrats and Republicans, don't you think people are going to find your new conclusion somewhat disappointing as someone who has been an important voice to politically independent people in America? Uh, no, because uh, the, here's the problem. Any third party, because of the media and the system that the, that the Democrats and the Republicans have set up, any third party that can sustain itself will likewise have to corrupt itself. So you've already got a two-headed monster. Why would you want a three-headed or four-headed one? Um, I would... so, and and here's, here's my belief, and, I, and, and in Chapter 2 of the book, I urge people to read this book. Because if you read this book and still vote for a Democrat or Republican, then it's your damn fault. Because when you read how corrupt they have destroyed our country through the years, and, and the point is, again, any third party will have to, to be just as corrupt to survive. And so here's what should happen, if we could make it happen. On every ballot, here's a simple thing that would be a huge change. On every ballot, don't list political parties at all. Just put the name down. Because they put their political parties on there so that you remain stupid. A conservative person walks into the voting booth, they don't need to know the name of the candidate. They look for Republican. If you're a liberal person, you don't have to know the name of the candidate. You look for Democrat. What this will do by removing gang symbols and gang names, as I call them, it will, it will make the voter have to then educate he or she self before they go in there. And if they don't and they just randomly pick names, I'd rather have that than what we have now. Do you think the American public 
looking at the American public, do you believe that we have gotten so to a point where almost the Democrats and the Republicans have become uh, by default football teams that we root for regardless of what they do? Pretty much, and also there's no different, you know, people need to understand that it's, and, and I'll put it in this context, it's like I taught this, one of the classes I taught at Harvard covered this, it's like pro wrestling. In front of the camera and in front of the media, they make off like they hate each other, and they're adversaries. Behind the scenes, they're going out to dinner, they're cutting deals, and they're making sure that they remain in power. And then speaking about that, as an elected member of Congress, no matter what crime you commit, based on your research, as long as it's not treason or espionage, you don't forfeit your pension, as you write on page 110. As a result, over the past 25 years, at least 20 lawmakers guilty of other serious offenses have enjoyed congressional retirement pay payments. There are many outrageous things that occur in our political climate, but to me, this took the cake. Was this surprising to you, or do you think, and do you think that the stock act will mean anything going forward to you know uh, I, I doubt it if you notice too that they, they that's why they all go in and come out millionaires because their rate of return is 12 percent now that's insider trading martha stewart they arrested her for it yet these guys can get away with it and then look at the whole system they've built the entire political system of our country is based on the concept of bribery you bribe them, you get what you want. If you don't, you're out of luck. Now, if we do that in the private sector, we go to jail. They don't. And then let's take it a step further, lying. They lie to us all the time. Nothing happens to them, yet if we lie to them, we go to jail. Look at, they got Roger Clemens and these sports guys with potential jail terms because they lied about using steroids or not. What the hell is that the government's business for? Okay. You know, you know, um, Governor Ventura. Uh, I, first of all, I, I want to say I like the book very much. I really, truly did. And 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 this is, of course, not the first book of yours I read. We had a, a, a great conversation with. I think this is going back to September uh, of two thousand eight. Don't start the revolution without me. And and you you you've kind of I believe you've adapted and adopted a new viewpoint based on more research that you've done. This book is really packed with research. One of the things I wanted to focus on, we do kind of live for better or worse in a short attention span theater kind of society. I think that's a negative, oh, yeah. not a positive. Uh, uh, people, especially I think a lot of younger people, are addicted to you know saying things in ten words on Twitter. Well, you know, or, or their their feed on Facebook. You can't learn what you've got to learn in in ten words or in a hundred fifty characters. Would you say? And and this might be like asking to pick a favorite child. But if you had to pick a chapter from your book, chapter sixteen where you kind of lay out uh, a, a narrative of third parties in America really stood out to me because you show all these third-party initiatives and then you really show where they ended up, which was nowhere too positive. Um, I'm, I'm not asking you to say, no, hey, no, usually, uh, let me interject. Ahead. Usually they absorb whatever it is that brought the third party into the game. And they do that so that they can tell the public, see, you don't need this third party. We'll take care of it. One good thing about a third party movement is many times it carries the agenda because these two parties are so focused like street gangs on getting rid of any competition that they will attempt to absorb whatever brought the third party into play. You really got me to thinking about Ross Perot. Perot was a great conundrum to me because back in 92, before the summer of 92, I really, really put a lot of stock in what Ross Perot was saying. And then he came out with, and I, you were generous in your book. You didn't go into detail, but he came out with that disruption of his, I think you termed it, uh, he, he was concerned with the disruption of his daughter's wedding. Uh, yeah. I, I think he painted it even something bigger. They were going to call certain things about her in question. And I said to myself at the time, why on earth would a guy air? He, he's basically saying to the public what he doesn't want them to say about his daughter. This makes no sense at all. Do you really believe, uh, as, as you, I mean, I guess you say it in your book, you say he didn't want to be president. Well, I think that he didn't. I think that he wanted to make this statement, and he got them to focus again. What we talked about earlier, 
he got them to focus temporarily